you always have kids that have like a natural inclination towards something. All right, some kids is sports, some kids it's study, some kids is cars, some kids is drawing. You know, there's always that kid in the back of the room always like drawing, yeah. doing sketches. And with me, it was movies. Once I got into it, I didn't have room for anything else. I couldn't spell anything. I couldn't remember anything. All right, but I could go to a movie, and I, I knew who starred in it, who directed it, who wrote it, everything. Actually, my my my, my parents all right, said, "Well, he's going to be a director someday," and everything. I didn't know what that was. I wanted to be an actor. So all through my childhood, all right, I thought, "You know, I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to be an actor." I would like uh, see a movie, and I'd like it. And I used to play with GI Joes all the time. This is the rugged new GI Joe adventure team. And I would always play movies, basically. I would just kind of like do my version of whatever I saw, you know? And then I would like be acting out all the parts with all the G.I. Joes, and I would be like, you know, kind of like directing these little plays just for myself with the G.I. Joes. And the same thing is like, you know, I would, you know, and I'd see some movies, because I saw all kinds of stuff, not just Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo, but like all kinds of like, uh, uh, um, you know, my mom took me to see Carl Knowledge. The reason I didn't say anything to Sandy I knew he wouldn't believe me. The Wild Bunch. You know, I would act them out like I saw in the movie. So I'd have like, the, oh, you dirty, you know, yeah. and oh, your mother, you know, and be like dealing to the Quentin. It's not me, Mom. That's just the dialogue from the movie. Like around age 22, I got a job at a place called Video Archives. People said, oh, so that's kind of like your film school. Here, this is the new film school. It was not a film school. It was like my village voice. I got to be Jay Hoberman. I got to be Andrew Saris of the store and arguing my points why this movie was good or why that movie was bad and everything. It was like I got the job because I already was a film expert, so to speak. I mean, that's why they hired me. People talk about, wow, you've had such success and it's just been so overnight and whatever. Well, whatever success I've got has come after like eight years of just nothing working out. So I started making this movie. Uh, I just. I came up with the idea for a short film that I was going to shoot. I was going to shoot it on Super 8. Then I ended up getting somebody's 16 millimeter camera. I was going to shoot it that way. And then I, I shot on it for like about a couple of weekends. I thought, well, hell, film's kind of cheap and everything like that. Why don't I just shoot it like a feature? And this was before She's Got to Have It. All right. Not, it was like after Stranger Than Paradise, but before She's Got to Have right. It. And um, so I just started shooting it that way. And I'm like, well, I'm going to make a feature. I'm going to make a 16 millimeter feature. Yeah. Black and white, it'll be cool. So I ended up working for like three years on this movie and this was going to be my feature and I right. was like and was financing it from working at a video store so what it means was like I would like get like two hundred dollars or so and then we'd go off and shoot for the weekend and then you would run out of money and then I would like go back to work again and then like eventually I would just keep piecing it together and what you would do is when you'd rent uh, equipment from a rental house if you rent it on Friday you have it all weekend it's kind of this one day yeah, rental right. and you have to return it Monday morning I had so little money that I couldn't even process this footage I ended up, after like about, about three years, I ended up like starting processing some of the footage and starting seeing exactly what I had. It was amateurish, and not in a charming way either. Now, there were good things about it, all right? You know, I mean, you could tell I made it. Skip 20 years later, I find out that the very day that I felt so depressed for no reason whatsoever just so happens to be the very same day that the greatest rock and roller of all time buys the farm. You could have spit my socks. I mean, I couldn't believe it. A big significant influence, okay, would be like Howard Hawks. He is the single greatest storyteller in the history of cinema. And probably the single most entertaining filmmaker in the history of cinema. I mean, when you're talking about people who've like, you know, worked for 30 years and have like, you know, 25, 30, 40 films to show for it. When you go through their films and everything like that, you know, you're, you're looking at this film and, and like, you know, oh, I, I never saw this one. I never saw this one that I really want to. And then like, um, you start seeing some of their later works or some like early minor work yeah. that you already heard about but never saw it. You always are more or less kind of disappointed. It's like, you know, that's okay. Yeah. It's good to see it so I can say I saw it and everything. Howard Hawks, except for one movie, never disappointed me. Mario Bava became one of the first directors that I got to know by name because I saw Black Sabbath on late night television and would like, kind of look forward to seeing it pop up again. He's a great Italian horror filmmaker. This is Black Sabbath. And uh, then I started 
noticing other movies in the TV guide that had his name and they all had this big, cool, operatic quality about them. Sergio Leone and Mario Bava got me thinking in terms of shots as opposed to just, uh, oh, uh, oh, I like this movie. Oh, this guy did a movie I like. Well, I'll see another movie that that guy does because I like that movie as opposed to just recognizing the name and hoping that another good movie would come out. I actually started recognizing a cinematic style and a signature and a quality in the movies that was just beyond a good movie versus another good movie or a not so good one. So even, you know, even when I would see Mario Bava movie I didn't like, I still recognized the style and uh, that same operatic quality. Abbott Castillo Meet Frankenstein is, that was probably my favorite movie when I was really, really, really young. My two favorite types of movies in the world were monster movies, the universal monster movies uh, from the 30s, and physical comedies like uh, Abbott and Castillo. I love them. Every kid I knew at that time loved Abbott and Costello, but Jerry Lewis. Do you know you're sitting on my hat? Laurel and Hardy, I thought all those guys were great. And those were like my favorite type of movies. I love W.C. Fields too, I was crazy for W.C. Fields. Godfrey Daniel. And so when I watched Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, it seemed, it, it was, it bended my mind about the fact that my two favorite genres, even though I didn't know what the word genre meant, could be put put into one movie. I didn't know that you could do that. I always thought there, there's this kind of movie and then there's this kind of movie. And it was, you know, like uh, uh, chocolate and peanut butter. All right. Hey, you got your comedy in my uh, horror film. Hey, you got your horror film in my comedy. Low profile. You understand the meaning of the words low profile? Thought, wow, this is the greatest movie ever. The two, my two favorite types of movies in one. When it's scary, it's really scary. And when it's funny, it's really funny. Their only chance is to fight back. Oh, yeah! And I guess I've been trying to do that a lot my the whole rest of my career. Sam Fuller's just crazy style was a big influence to me. De Palma was a big influence to me. He's one I saw. Yes, he says he pulled a girl out of the car. And I would like you to forget about her. And one of the things about De Palma that people never talk about, and I, I think De Palma is probably the greatest uh, um, black uh, satirist of the last 20 years in cinema. His films are, are, are hysterical, biting black comedies. No one has his wit. What was that? His wit is just fantastic. Into poverty. And, you know, Scorsese's just daring. And inflation. Today I say to you, we have reached the turning point. One of the greatest movies of the 70s, if not the greatest. And um, uh, it's also one of my um, top five favorite movies. One of the things about Taxi Driver that is just so magnificent, as I actually do feel, it may be the greatest first-person character study ever committed to film. No matter how dark the material was, there was a, such an exuberance to filmmaking that I don't know if anyone will ever quite have the run of films that he had in the 70s leading into the 80s. And I actually met De Palma, and I was sitting there uh, uh, talking to him about cinema and stuff, and he talked about the um, the uh, friendly competition that he would uh, he would enjoy with uh, Scorsese, and uh, he talked about making uh, Scarface, and you know he's making this epic and he thinks he's doing one of his best works ever, and during the shooting of Scarface, Raging Bull comes out, and so he goes and sees Raging Bull at the theater. And then it just starts off with that opening credit shot of that classical music playing and slow motion and the big wide shot of the ring and Jake LaMotta there just bouncing in slow motion in his robe. And he talked about, oh, no matter what you do, 
No matter how good you are, there's always Scorsese. Sergio Leone. He was like the first, like, like you know, director where I, where I, when I started like really thinking about becoming a filmmaker, where I was like, wow, I mean, well, that's a director. And you can even like watch the whole filmmaking process, you know, I mean, uh, I, if you're thinking along those lines, if you're just trying to watch an entertaining story, it's mm -hmm. there. And then also uh, a major influence uh, was uh, Jean-Luc Godard, uh, basically because his, uh, his inventiveness and his like breaking the rules and commenting on cinema while you're watching cinema. The other thing also is uh, there's a French director named Jean-Pierre Melville who came out in the 50s and basically started doing a whole series of, and he was like a total like entertainment director he did a whole series of, uh, of crime films always like set in Paris or Marseille or something um, that were basically the Warner Brothers Bogart Cagney films all right but completely set to this like French Parisian rhythm and they're great and they work very much in the same way that like Sergio Leone's films do where they take a genre that like, we know left, right, forwards, up and down and backwards. But they do it with a whole different style and a whole different perspective. And here they've basically reinvented the genre. They've created something new that didn't exist before. Now that's what I'm always kind of trying to do with my genre films. I don't know if I'm succeeding or not, but that's the attempt. To take something you've seen before, I love it, I respect it, but I'm also trying to reinvent it in a way. You know, do a heist film. Deliver the goods as a heist film, but it's a heist film when you never see the heist. People ask me from time to time, do you make a movie with an audience in mind? And my answer is, yes, I do. All right, but the audience I have in mind isn't some faceless blobs that I'm trying to second guess. It's me. I'm the audience. I'm the guy that goes out and pays $7 or $8 in New York you know, to go and see a movie. If I'm excited about seeing a movie, I see it on opening day. I am the audience. I was betting that there are other people like me out there. And I was a little surprised at how many there were. I'm making specific films. And if you make a specific film, that's not everything for everybody. You're going to turn some people off, all right? But you're going to turn some people on, too. According to Palma, De Palma has said that when you do violence, you actually get penalized for doing it well. Packs don't get penalized for uh, 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 you know showing anything because it doesn't mean anything. So in a way, they're saying good filming. Humor is a magnifying glass. All right, for us to look at society, ourselves our personalities, uh, our problems, and you know, I mean, you know, humor is what we need to actually observe things, all right, and actually put them in perspective. I try not to get, when I'm writing something, I try not to get analytical about it. <laughs> when people talk about dogs being as violent as it was. You ever listen to Kay Billy's Super Sounds of the 70s? I was afraid people would be bored because it's people talking to each other. It's my personal favorite. Well, I guess I just did a good job. But the thing is, I was watching uh, uh, this film from the 30s, Backstreet, with Irene Dunn. Right. I mean, it's a wonderful melodrama, absolutely terrific melodrama. And I was sitting there watching it, and there, there was a, the thing is, because I think Dogs is really funny, too. That's a really funny movie. Um, but the thing is, I'm watching Backstreet, and um, tragedy is almost like another character in the movie. It's hovering over every scene. You know this is gonna end horrible for her, all right? And, um, and so even when a light moment happens and you laugh, you only laugh so much because it's just tragedies like this other thing in the room. And in a way, Reservoir Dogs, that was a relationship violence had to Reservoir Dogs. Even though there was only, like you could count the number of scenes that there's actually a violent incident happening in it, violence was like another character in the room. It hung over the proceedings. You kept waiting for every conversation to break out into it. So even if it was funny, the audience might have laughed, but when they got out of the theater, they don't remember laughing. 